So if you recall from the previous video, most traditional viruses work by modifying the entry point of their host application. And it's either by, um, and let me actually give you a bit of a diagram here. So imagine you've got an application here with a, with a bunch of instructions. And the entry point, recall, is kind of the first instruction that, uh, that can be executed in an application. And what traditional viruses did is they either uh, modify the entry point of the host application, and, and that was typically by um, replacing that application with, with virus code, or replacing maybe the first few instructions with virus code, or alternatively what they could have done is take that application, replace the very first instruction with uh, the very first, I guess, the entry point with, uh, with virus code, then have that code point to the rest of the body of the virus, which was then maybe appended to, to the actual executable itself. And then afterwards, what would happen is, is kind of regardless, once the virus is done running, it would transfer control back to the, the rest of the application. And, and, and this is kind of what, what basic viruses did. Uh, but, and you can imagine with this particular technique, it was not so difficult for the antivirus community to really deal with because the, the virus body itself was located in a very specific place. And, and moreover, changes to a program's entry point would immediately raise a red flag. Uh, going further, and I think to really get around this issue, a lot of virus writers began to use encryption techniques within their virus. So in this case, uh, again, let's kind of imagine our sample application uh, is that you would have an application with a bunch of instructions. And now what the virus would do is it would have two parts. So the first part of the virus would um, do the usual thing. It would kind of modify the entry point, And then it would append a decryption routine. The decryption routine itself would be one part of the virus, and the rest of the virus would be an encrypted payload. So imagine this is kind of an encrypted virus at the bottom. It's gray, so we don't know what it is. Um, and then on execution, uh, the, the first instruction would be going to the entry point right here. It would transfer control to the main body of the virus. And the main body of the virus would basically comprise this decryption routine, and it would execute what we call a decryption loop. So decryption loop. Loop, and the decryption loop would in turn decrypt the encrypted payload, and what you would have then is actually kind of a raw, unencrypted virus. And really, the the decryption routine after it's done would then execute this part of the virus. And as before, once that part of the virus has been executed, control gets passed back to the main body of the program. Now, what's interesting here is that you can't really see the the core contents of the virus until the actual code is being executed. Uh, you can't see it ahead of time. You can only see it when the routine is actually decrypted, which is happening during execution of the thread itself. It's, it's kind of happening at this point after the encryption routine runs, uh, then you can see the, the main body of the virus, but not before it. Now, in addition to that, the virus would have to carry, in addition to carrying the encryption routine, the virus would typically, or rather, in, in addition to carrying the decryption routine, the virus might also carry the encryption routine with it, and let's say somewhere in the virus payload would be the encryption routine. And the reason you would need to know the encryption routine is so you can infect other files. And so what the virus would then do is, is let's say it's infecting a new file, maybe it's, it's infecting a file that's on a file share somewhere, or maybe uh, uh, somebody plugged in a, a USB stick, or I guess this is in the old days, maybe a floppy drive or a floppy disk. Uh, in that case, what would then happen is, is the virus would uh, take a copy of itself and it would kind of encrypt itself and, and it would encrypt itself with a slightly would be a different key but the same routine and so even though um, you would see the virus copy itself because the encryption routine is being used the results are going to be a bit different okay the, the results are going to be uh, slightly different and the reason for that is that the encryption routine might use a different decryption, a different encryption key, uh, and as such, also a different encryption key. So use, uh, and I'll put the word "different" in here. So use a different encryption key. Okay, but the rest of the loop would be the same. Now, at first, you might think this approach it, it seems kind of like a very difficult situation to deal with. You know, however, what what, it, what turned out to be the case is that for Kind of basic encrypted viruses, the decryption routine is pretty much the same thing each time. The only thing that really changes is the key. And so you can actually come up with detection capabilities that are centered around the decryption routine. And in particular, you could you could take the decryption loop itself 
and come up with a signature on the decryption loop. So come up with a signature for that. Imagine coming up with a signature from this loop itself. Okay, and this is actually pretty powerful because you can imagine that in most cases, you would be unlikely to see a legitimate software application with this exact same decryption loop and, and the decryption loop might be long enough uh, for you to uh, to go ahead and use it, use it as a basis of a signature. Now, there is a bit of a danger here since the decryption routine might itself be a relatively compact piece of code and as such that might increase the likelihood that a legitimate software program would you know, just by some happenstance happen to employ the same set of instructions in the same sequence for that small code block. And so if you did run in that situation and if you were to use the decryption routine as the basis for a signature, you would run the risk of a false positive and that's a scenario in which you would inadvertently uh, mislabel an otherwise benign file as malicious. So to circumvent this, one thing you could do is if you were an antivirus researcher, you could employ a two-step approach. Uh, in the first step, you could see if the decryption routine is potentially malicious, does it kind of match a decryption routine signature? And if so, you can imagine then emulating the actual decryption routine. Um, you know, you can do this in software, you can emulate it to kind of figure out what the decrypted contents would look like. Now, emulation in general is it's, it's more expensive from a computational perspective. However, uh, in this case, you would only have to do it if the decryption routine were suspicious, which hopefully wouldn't happen that often. And so it would only be in cases where that extra degree of, of, of effort is warranted that you would carry it out and actually try emulation. And then, and then if you emulated the, the decryption routine, you could figure out what the actual encrypted contents would look like and determine if they happen to pose a threat and if they happen to correspond to an actual virus. Now, given these defense measures, the virus writer started employing another technique. And this technique is, is a very powerful one, and it's, it's worth kind of writing on. It's called polymorphism. So polymorphism. Now, obviously, it kind of literally means taking on multiple shapes. And the idea behind polymorphism was that each virus would carry with it a mutation engine. And the mutation engine would allow you to generate completely different or, or seemingly different looking decryption routine. So instead of having a static decryption routine that, that kind of works with everything, you would now have a mutation engine as part of the virus payload and that mutation engine would in turn generate a new decryption engine. So imagine that uh, you had your, imagine in, in this particular scenario you had your, your virus and uh, it was trying to spread. So let's say you, you had your virus and uh, what the virus would have, it, it would have a bunch of instructions and it would be encrypting a file. So let's, let's say it's infecting a file. And so the first instruction, the, the entry point, points to the main body of the virus, which is appended below. The main body of the virus typically would contain a decryption routine. Um, and then uh, would decrypt. Let's say you, you had some encrypted content down here. This encrypted content would get decrypted. You determine that it's malicious. Uh, and in, as part of that decrypted content, you would also have a mutation engine. And let's, let's kind of label that yellow to kind of be consistent with colors. Uh, and then when that virus was being propagated, when a new threat or when a new file came up and you were trying to propagate that threat to that new file, uh, you could do so by generating a new decryption routine. And so um, you know, imagine now that the decryption routine uh, would look a bit different. And so rather than being the same old decryption routine that, that you knew in the past, uh, imagine that it's, it's just a bit different. Maybe it's something like this. Okay, and then you have the rest of the body down here that's been decrypted. And again, you, you would carry with it the mutation engine. And of course, the mutation engine would be, initially would be encrypted until you actually decrypt it to run the, the virus body itself and to, to kind of infect new files. Now, you know, it turns out that polymorphism, there definitely are challenges from a virus writer's perspective in, in the sense that you have to deal with the the possibility of having a single engine that can generate many mutations. And it, in fact, it turns out that in many cases, the complexity of the mutation engine really eclipsed that of the underlying virus. Today, however, polymorphism is, is pretty much kind of standard fare, standard practice used by most threats. And, and you can actually find tools that handle all the, the polymorphism details for you. And so uh, I think it's important to understand that you know these techniques did come about you know, a long time ago, and, and they have been morphed and adapted to uh, regular Trojans. And, and overall, I mean, the, the kind of antivirus community has, has kind of co-evolved with the virus writer. So as new uh, virus techniques came out and, and new defenses of those techniques came out, 
uh, the virus fighters were forced to, to come up with even more novel ways of, of trying to get their viruses to work. Uh, and now we do have a set of techniques that uh, have evolved over some time and are quite powerful, both from the, the virus fighters' perspective as well as from the, the antivirus community's perspective.